Hello again guys, it's Greg Olo Productions here, and welcome to my alarm clock display staircase if you want to be really technical about it, but otherwise I call it my display room. So what are we doing in here? Well, to start off a very special series, I figured we'd at least start in a special room, at least for me. This is where all the clocks are. And the clock we're going to be discussing in this particular series has been completely overlooked, thrown in the trash, run into the ground, you name it, this clock has had it happen. Now, this clock, as I said, has been overlooked, and people know about it, but they don't know about it. They don't really look into it, or what, it, what happened to it, or anything like that. People just kind of have these things around. I shouldn't say nobody has tried to do something with this model. Bill Stoddard, Jim Linz, and maybe a few others have talked about this particular model. But myself, with the help of Pin Palette 20, have decided to team up, or collab, and put together the complete story of West Clock's Style 66 movement and all the models and all the story that went with this particular clock. As I said, it's around, but no one really cares about it. So here we are, we're putting together the complete story of West Clock's workhorse, the Style 66. Oh yeah, and I never answered the question of what I'm even doing in here. I'm surrounded by 66s. Well, not entirely surrounded, but there's a lot of them in here, so. We're going to be using almost all of them for this series. Nothing like a good collection showcase, eh, viewers? I know everyone's going to be happy about that. Oh, yeah, you bet. Just from doing this project with Pin Palette 20 or Google, it's been... It's become very apparent to me that this clock has affected the alarm clock business in general in a substantial way. A lot of people benefited from the 66, more than West Clock could probably ever imagine, originally. So without further ado, viewers, let's get into this clock and see why I'm even bothering with it. The 1920s had been a prosperous time for West Clock. At the start of the decade, West Clock opened a factory in Canada, which by 1930 was well underway, producing most of the models available in the US. The flagship models of West Clock in general in 1930 were the peg leg and base models of Big and Baby Ben. The base versions of these clocks, which would later be known as the Style 2s by collectors, were commonly referred to as the Big and Baby Ben Deluxe, both of which retailed for $3.75. The peg leg models of Big and Baby Ben, which would later be known as the Style 1s, would retail for $3.25. So to understand what a Big and Baby Ben actually are, here are two uh, parts movements here. This is a Big Ben loud alarm movement. These guys, this is this one here is from 1936. They were basically the loud alarms uh, with a few changes, nothing detrimental. You know, there wasn't there wasn't some super significant change. You know, sometimes like um, instead of having a switch on the top like the style one and twos did, this one's got a pull and push. Uh, lever which basically acts as you know how you turn the alarm on and off But it's more or less the same movement and you can interchange parts Fairly well, I'm I would say you can mostly do that So Big Ben was more or less the same from 1908 to 1956 the loud alarm models were this completely does not count the chime alarm models guys don't put those in here And as for baby Ben here this movements from the 40s. I think this one's from 1948 or so uh, this guy uh, from 1912 more or less stayed the same like Big Ben did up until 1956 as well, I believe. I think that's when these were discontinued. Uh, I'll wait. No, sorry. Sorry. I think these guys uh, were around till 1962 in one way or another. They, I think Baby Ben changed more over the years than Big Ben. The point is, throughout the entire production run, they were mostly the same. So to give you guys an understanding of the functionality of these clocks, I have got my serviced style 5 Big Ben here and my also my service style 5 Baby Ben. Uh, these guys are lacking the repeat function that, uh, well, the Big Ben doesn't, but we'll get to that. Uh, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, Baby Ben here lacks the repeat function uh, that the style 1 and style 2, aka the peg and base uh, models, had in 1932. Anyway, that's you'll find out what I mean in a minute. So, okay, so we're looking at these. They're both the same price in 1932. 
I can hear one ticking, that's Big Ben. I can't hear this guy ticking, he's still running though. What the heck is the difference between these two clocks, other than cosmetics and just the ticking volume? Okay, well they both run for 36 hours. I haven't found, well, actually I shouldn't definitively say that because I haven't found a source that says these clocks run for 30 to 36 hours. That's just kind of what I'm getting out of it. Just from running these clocks, I think they run somewhere around 30 hours. Okay, so what the heck's the difference between these two clocks? Well, it's the alarm. Big Ben has a way louder and more harsh alarm, and I'll just give you a brief demonstration of that. And if you decide to, and back in the day they had this, you can either have the alarm be just steady, or you can have it repeat. So I'll show you what that sounds like, or I'll show you what the repeat sounds like. You can't turn off the repeat function in this. That's just the way this is designed. Um, they, they cut the steady out, so I'll just trip the alarm here. And I'll let that repeat once. All the animals upstairs are freaking out. We'll wind up Baby Ben here. Let's just show you what his alarm sounds like. And also, some of you probably have noticed the soft and loud uh, function here. That wasn't an option on this, so we're not even going to demonstrate that. So I'm just going to set it to loud because that's what the default is. Yeah, you get the idea there. That's uh, the default there. This just moves a piece of cloth in front of the alarm hammer. Um, which this doesn't have. Yeah, it's not that sophisticated. Anyway, we'll let Baby Ben go off. And Big Ben's alarm is way longer than this. I think this goes for probably about five minutes or so. Baby Ben probably runs, uh, the alarm probably goes for about 60 seconds. So as a consumer, you have to kind of think, okay, what do I, what do I want to wake up to? Do I want the alarm that's really loud and it shuts off and on over and over again? Or if I want, you know, just set it to steady and it'll just keep going. For a lot of people, they wanted that. Okay, what does Baby Ben have to offer to the table? After all, they're the same price. Uh, Baby Ben has a shorter alarm by far. And he's also uh, even the, well, the alarm's shorter and it's quieter than Big Ben. Big Ben's alarm is way louder than this. Uh, I think Big Ben's over the top, uh, so I'm not gonna buy him. I'm gonna buy Baby Ben because I like his alarm, but wait a minute, hold on. Please, please bear in mind, guys, that these are not period correct clocks for this little, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, this little scenario I'm building here. Remember, this is 1932, these two don't technically exist. We're comparing movement functionality and how they work. Now, in the 1990s, the Style Mine, or actually no, it was 1978, I think, that these Style Mine uh, Big and Baby Bens came out. Honestly, these things are so crap. Uh, I'm not even going to consider them West Clock. Let's pretend that the Style Mine isn't even West Clock because it's not. Uh, yeah, let's pretend it's not West Clock. And uh, let's compare it to Baby Ben. Okay, well, Baby Ben's alarm is good, but hang on a minute. Uh, why wouldn't I just go for the competition, which basically has the same alarm? Just listen to this. Where's the... Where's the... Okay, this, this basically ha Okay, so this competition here, this guy basically has the same alarm. Why wouldn't I just go for the cheaper clock with, you know, that, you know, it's similar to Baby Ben and it's less expensive. It, ba it basically does the same thing. It runs for 30 hours or whatever. Why would I spend more money if I don't have to? So with that in mind, you know, if you want something like Baby Ben, except you don't think it's worth paying for a Baby Ben, you could just go for the competition. West Clock had that idea in mind. So to sort of compensate for the gap, you know, the price gap, I mean, this was $3.75. That was somewhat expensive. Uh, you didn't want to pay that, and you thought the alarm was good. Well, you could get one of West Clock's other products that were not a big or baby Ben. They were still a clock. This is the role that the sleep meter, the Ben-Hur, 
and all of these type of movements, and this is the type of movement this has, more or less, the alarm hammers on these uh, varied from model to model, but it was more or less this movement here that kind of was sort of like Baby Ben, but, you know, functionality-wise, it had that alarm and everything, and it, it was less expensive, and it was still a good clock, so... And plus, you had more case variety. You didn't have to go with the little case like this. You could get something bigger. And if you were a fan of the oncoming Art Deco style, Big and Baby Ben didn't... They sort of did, but not really. They didn't really come in, in, in an Art Deco case. So if you wanted a more modern-looking clock, one of these would probably be the way to go. And um, also, if you didn't need a crazy loud alarm like Big Ben has, this would be the way to go. So by offering the consumer these sort of baby Ben or just kind of, well, I actually consider them more just kind of a standard alarm clock. Baby Ben was sort of the flagship standard alarm clock, but if you wanted a more standard, you know, just kind of a, oh yeah, it just has an alarm and, you know, that's all well and good type deal. I, although I think because of the case on this one, this one might have been a little more expensive. I think it was still cheaper than a bigger baby Ben though. But anyway, the point is you want something more kind of standardized and more like everything else, you know, just an alarm will be good for you and you don't need some like super loud alarm or the ticking on this, you know, this has a really quiet tick. That was a feature that was advertised on this. If you don't really care about that and you like the alarm and you want to pay less, that's what you go for one of these guys. So that's the idea. You know, the alarm is, is less spectacular on this and you don't, you don't really need some crazy, you know, alarm or anything like that. So this is the role that these guys filled. So if you don't need a super loud alarm and you don't care about a super quiet tick or you don't care about, you know, you want no frills, just kind of a nice case and a good hardworking clock that'll ring, you know, be dependable, get you up in the morning don't want to wake up the whole house, but still want to wake yourself up. This is kind of this, this is what you'd go for. And this, this kind of idea was good for a lot of people. And this is the movement that they had. This roll here, uh, this roll would be replaced by the 66. Because as you can see here, just by looking at this movement, there are a lot of parts in here that are actually interchangeable with Big Ben. Uh, with a Big Ben loud alarm. This is his spring barrel here. Part of the gear train belongs to him. This balance wheel for sure belongs to him. This alarm mechanism here does not belong to him. This uh, wheel here definitely does. I think this wheel does too. So there's, so it's a little, it's not necessarily, you know, it, this isn't like dirt uh, cheap to make. There is a, still a certain degree of effort that uh, that goes into this not that the 66 doesn't but this is still somewhat expensive for west clock to make and you know since it kind of fills this bread and butter roll here i think the company wanted to experiment and see if they could have this kind of idea but not pay as much to build it so that's that's cost cutting for you so if we're going to be talking about all these 66s, we might as well understand first how they actually work. So this is one I've just serviced, and we're going to go around to the back of it and see what's cooking here. So it all starts with the mainspring here, and this mainspring is hooked on to this wheel, this big wheel here. This is called the great wheel. It's hooked on to this, and the other end of the spring is hooked on to this pillar here. Now if we take a winding key and screw it onto the back of the pillar here, if I can get it on. There it is. This guy was made, let's see, what, what year were you made? Oh, where's your date code? Uh, there we go. August 14th, 1946. Yep, okay, I thought it was, you gotta be careful. I, I misread that as 48 a few times. Anyway, that's irrelevant. So anyway, we're winding the spring up. So the spring is getting pulled into a tighter ball. And as you can see, there's this mechanism here which locks the, um, the spring in place. As you can see, it's turning. There's little fingers on the end of it. And it's keeping, basically keeping my progress as I'm going here. 
So what we've just done is the spring is now, as I said, it's still hooked up against the pole, or sorry, around the pole, and it's also hooked up on the wheel here. It's hooked into the wheel. So now the great wheel turns very, very slow, and as you can see, it gets geared in as I stop it. It's geared to this pinion here. I believe this is called a lantern pinion, and you can see there's trunnions in there. So these gear teeth gear into the trunnions, and they turn the center wheel, and that's what that's called there. The center wheel turns another wheel uh, via the same methods of communication, and then it goes down the gear train. This wheel keys into this wheel here, which as you can see is moving, which keys into the escape wheel, and I think there's, oh, there's, pin, there's a pinion there, not a lantern pinion. And then you've got the pallet fork, which is taking the power and is constantly locking and unlocking. As you can see there, it's moving to the right and the left. And it goes to the balance wheel here. So now what the balance wheel is doing is it's letting the spring down very, very slow. And what this lever here is, this is a regulator. So the position of this can alter the speed, and that's due to the hairspring. So the hairspring basically decides how fast the clock goes. And if the hairspring is made smaller, it runs faster. And if the hairspring is made slightly bigger, it'll run slower. So what, how that works is you got the regulator and you can see the one coil is going through the regulator and the regulator moves back and forth depending on how you adjust it. And it's able to just, you know, since that's such a fine piece of machinery, any little sort of adjustment there, even in the slightest way, of it making it bigger or smaller just by holding the hairspring in a certain position because that's what the regulator does is able to affect the speed if that makes any sense so this is a very simple gear train here okay um that's great greg how do you how does this thing translate into hands that you know tell the time well if we go around to the front so in summary power goes all the way to the balance wheel which decides how fast the clock runs. Well, that's great, Greg. How does this thing actually translate all this power into hands that move? So if we go around to the front here, you can see that there is a, right under that wheel there, there is a, what's called a shuck pinion or a cannon pinion. So it is right in there. That's where that, that's where that pinion is. And as you can see, it's on the uh, center arbor here which has a knob on the back. It is pressed onto the center arbor. And if we turn this knob back here, this is just pressed on, you can see that there's like a clutch here. So we have access to bypass the, um, the power of the gear train. We can turn this, this uh, shuck pinion. This then moves an intermediate wheel right here which has a, I don't know what kind of, what you'd call this, but it has a gear on it. We'll just use that very bland terminology, which moves this wheel here. And what the, all this is, what you're looking at here, is the minute pipe, or this is the minute arbor. So this whole thing with the knob on the back and it goes through the center wheel here, all of that, that is the minute hand. This drives the minute hand. And this wheel here, this intermediate wheel, this drives this thing which the hour hand fits onto that. That's terrific. Okay, what the heck is all this? I think this movement could, you know, it'd be a lot, it'd be a lot less complicated looking if it didn't have an alarm. So this guy has an alarm on it, and this intermediate wheel drives the hour pipe, but it also drives the alarm mechanism for this thing. Now we'll start at the beginning here again. This also has a spring, and it's done in the same fashion. You've got a loop here, uh, I believe, yeah, it's, there's the rivet right there. So we've got a loop end mainspring. This is riveted together here. Then it's looped around this pillar here. And there's an alarm. Well, there's a great wheel here, technically, except it's for the alarm. And instead of having a bunch of gears that go into all these different, you know, slowly take the power away, slowly slow the spring power down, you've just got one escape wheel here attached to it or that it keys into. This then powers the alarm hammer, so the hammer goes left, right. It's basically a replica of, of the escapement here, except it's um, except it's way less uh, accurate, I guess. 
And this is a special 66 here, and not a lot of these have this lever on here. And I'll just grab a parts movement here quick uh, so you can see what I'm talking about. So usually they've got the alarm. As you can see, this is dirty. There's no, there's the hammer, and then there's no lever here. You can just see there's a hole where the rivet would have gone for that to be in. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, this is... This is your on and off switch, this lever here. On these other ones that don't have a lever, the on and off switch is part of the case. So it interacts with this thing here, but we'll, we'll get to that later. So in place of an on and off switch that's on the case, this guy actually has a lever on him. So right now he's turned off. So as you can see, it's got this paddle on it. The lever is riveted to the plate here. You got the switch right here. You can move it. It blocks the hammer from doing anything. Well, Greg, it's not blocked now. Why isn't the hammer doing anything? Well, the alarm isn't tripped to go off. So this is just your alarm on and off. This is like if you don't want the clock to ring, period, this is what you do. You just switch it off. But if you do want it to ring, okay, so you turn it on. And then what happens up here is there is a, well, you can see the intermediate wheel. We're back here again. There's this other wheel here. And then there's a spring under that, and then there's this cam thing here. Where does this go? Ooh, it goes through the movement. Hey, look, there's a leaf spring and another knob. So what this is, is uh, us, us 66 fans <laughs> have, a, have a fun name for this particular cam. We call it the cheese wheel cam. Usually when they're brass like this, they, they resemble a wheel of cut cheese. That's the first thing I thought of when I saw one of these for the first time. I thought, oh, that's a cut wheel of cheese on there. So that's what we call that particular cam. So what this does is once every 12 hours, this, this wheel here runs around. So as you can see, the wheel that drives the hour hand, or this particular, um, I don't know what you, I still don't know what you'd call this, this piece here, this drives the hour hand, this wheel here goes around once every 12 hours. This wheel here also goes around once every 12 hours. And once it goes around, so I'm just speeding up the process here by turning the, the knob. So what the, what there is here is there's a piece of, there's, well, I don't know what you'd call it. I think it's pressed out and it's bent up and that's deliberate. So what this does is it's under this cheese wheel cam and then it comes out. Oh, look at that. The alarm's ringing now. So to set the alarm, you have access to the knob here, so you can turn the cheese wheel cam whatever way you want. So once every 12 hours, this wheel will come around and the alarm will trip whether the spring is wound up or not. So this spring here, this, this kind of bar looking thing, this has got a tip on it. And as you can see, there's this tab here. Where does this tab go? Oh, it's attached to the hammer, okay. So this hammer is blocked by this bar spring here. And when the cheese wheel or when or yeah, when the tab when the tab comes around, this all unlocks. I'm just holding this with my hand here. All of this unlocks. This bar spring is is uh, it essentially well it springs upward. Then the hammer is free to do whatever it wants. Depending what you have for this, the case has the switch on it, which is out of the way. Or if you have this particular movement, which is, you know, it's a, it's a standard 66. The only difference is it, is, is it has a switch on it. The switch is out of the way, so now the hammer can do whatever the heck it wants. And in this case, it's doing that. And the bell does not sound like this. I'm just holding it. So this is what it looks like when the alarm is going off. So as you can see there, the spring was slowly expanding and this wheel was turning and this wheel was turning and then all this was happening. So I hope that makes some degree of sense here. There you go, you can see that a little bit more. I hope that makes some degree of sense. Power goes through here, goes all the way here. It's transferred into here. Whoops, let me just turn this off here. It's nice having the switch on the actual movement itself. Anyway. The power goes through the gear train and it's slowed down through these gears just enough to get it to actually, well, to be over here on in the center here, uh, translate that power into hours and, min and minutes here. So this is the minute pipe and then the hour pipe is on top of that and then there's this intermediate wheel. 
which is unfortunately riveted to the plate. You can't get this guy off. Let me just grab a parts movement. This is a later one. This is aluminum. And yeah, this wheel here is riveted to the plate. And this guy wins this from November of 1956. Yeah, so. So this that's stuck on there. They work the same way though. There's no difference. And then of course you got the cheese wheel cam, which you can set it to whatever time you want. And you know what? I'm just gonna grab uh, an assembled 66 so you can kind of visualize that better. Okay, so we're looking at an assembled 66 now. This is a 1937 uh, Sphinx here. There's the switch. This one's on the case. There's no lever. This is what you have access to control-wise. You got your speed controller here. You can adjust the, the hairspring. You got your time uh, knob, alarm knob, and winding keys for both mainsprings. So if we just wind this, oh, it's already wound up, okay. So we'll disengage the quote-unquote off button here. So whatever, whatever time this little hand here points to on this little dial up here, this is when the alarm will go off. So if I go around and trip it at 11 here, there we go. And it'd be the same sort of deal uh, when the hands are turning clockwise, it would eventually reach the 11 point. You'd have uh, your off button, it'd be pulled up in this case. Did it there for just a half a second there. Um, yeah, th this would be pulled up and then it would trip at, at uh, 6 o'clock or whatever. So I hope that makes some degree of sense, viewers. This is how these work. They're very simple. Uh, they can be a total nuisance to work on sometimes, not all the time. One final thing I should mention is that this alarm assembly here, this is based on tension. So there's a washer in here. So this arbor that the cheese wheel cam is on has a squared off edge as you can see there kind of it's round in here and it's square under the leaf spring i think you can just kind of see that in there if i turn it you can kind of see a little better anyway there's a washer here that doesn't allow the rounded edge to go past the plate here then on top of that there's the leaf spring and on top of that this alarm knob is pressed on and some of the really early 66s had it where this was screwed on instead of pressed on so this keeps the cheese wheel under tension and it's always kind of pressing up against this um, alarm, I don't know what you'd even call this, the alarm trip wheel, I guess. And it doesn't allow the cheese wheel, like if, if, this, if this isn't adjusted right, this cam will go along with this wheel. And that's really bad because then your alarm is basically moving with the main gear train and that's not what you want you want your clock set in a or alarm set in a fixed position so like 6 a.m or whatever you want the alarm to stay there you don't want it to go moving around with the rest of the gear train and just go off at some random time well viewers i know that was a long video and i thank you for sitting through it but yeah that is the preliminary kind of background information for the style 66 that west clock had that's the environment that it was born into and that's the kind of job it had to fill. So now we get into the more interesting part of these collab with uh, Pin Palette 20. There will be more parts of this story and it'll just be continuing from here. So that's all the interesting parts there. This wasn't as interesting. Well, maybe you did find it interesting. I hope you did. Uh, I enjoyed making this. It took a while to make, uh, just mostly because school and you know other things are going on. I, my, my life is going on here. But yeah, I enjoyed making that, and I hope to continue this series with Pin Palette 20 and tell the story of the Style 66. And of course, a big thanks to Bill Stoddard, who set up ClockHistory.com. Without him, none of this would have been possible. I couldn't have done this and found all the advertisements. I mean, maybe I could have, but newspapers don't usually have, well, they don't have TikTok magazine, I'll tell you that much. TikTok Magazine was a great asset to use in this. You know, all, all his resources, he's got them compiled together in a nice area there. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go on clockhistory.com. It's a great website. You'll learn a lot about this stuff. So, yeah. Thank you, Bill. And uh, I couldn't have done I, I could not have done this without you. So, thanks. As for me now, I'm off. 
and I hope to see you in the actual episode one of this series where we actually talk about the 66 and then go from 1932 onwards. Anyways, thanks guys.